Go ahead and get that thing. Happy plan. What is that? A happy plan. Extreme green. Ooh. Is there kale in that? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. It's got all that. So kale, spirulina, all the blue green algae. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is stuff that you can trust. Steam definitely. All right. We're alive. I'm going to get cozy with you just for the shot. All right, we are live uh, via Vancouver with Zach Wolk. Um, I'm going to uh, queue up our Skype connection with Zach here. Um, we have him um, live uh, in the bar, ready to go. I'm going to give him his 10-second uh, his warning. And uh, let's get him full screen here on Skype. And... Uh, uh, let's go over uh, live to Zach live from Vancouver. If you have any questions, um, feel free to send an instant message through the stream.tv and I will make sure Zach and his uh, wonderful guest get it. So uh, let's start the show. I'm in excellent health. Okay, oh, well, man, there is a lot in that stuff. We're on live now. Hello. So I want uh, Zach again reporting live from the road on Monday, um, March 19th, I believe. And I'm with uh, Mark Emery, the Prince of Paw. We're in Vancouver, BC, at the uh, BCMP Vapor Lounge. The BCMP Marijuana Party Vapor Lounge, which is the headquarters for cannabis culture, and um, you know your reputation precedes you. So I thought we'd just jump into some of the issues. Now you're facing extradition to the United States. May 28th to June 1st, a five-day hearing here at the BC Supreme Court. Now I know you've said it, you you must have gone through it a million times, but why are you facing extradition to the United States of America? I wanted to. Defend defeat the U.S. drug war, and in 1990 I started trying my hand at that because books and magazines about marijuana were banned in Canada from 1987 to 1995, and in 1990 I started breaking that ban, and eventually we overturned that ban in 1995 when we finally get to a courtroom to overturn that. It was unconstitutional, and since then we have pioneered the idea of the modern-day hemp store in Canada and through the United States. I started publishing Cannabis Culture magazine 12 years ago, and I'm the editor now for a couple of years, and so we have Pot TV. We were the first video video webcasting network of any kind on the internet, starting in uh, January first, two thousand, and we broadcast eleven million shows to people all about marijuana. So we built this great political revolutionary infrastructure. There was also a capitalist-based infrastructure, whereby we encourage people to open hemp stores, gather that money up, use that money to subvert the democratic system and promote peaceful democratic change, and then the drug war. And the DEA knows it, and that we gave away four million dollars in the last ten years to. to that effort we finance uh, the global marijuana marches all over the world we finance Supreme Court challenges I finance ballot initiatives in Arizona Alaska Washington DC Nevada we finance a class action suit against the US federal government in Philadelphia in 1999 with $30,000 and on and on and on that was the whole idea it was supposed to be an economic engine to generate money to basically overgrow the US federal government and I say overgrow meaning a, a bot botanical and biological assault on the US drug war in the most peaceful means possible. We're going to outgrow them. We're going to grow so many marijuana plants so they can't possibly cut them all down as fast as we can grow them. And that's our strategy. And, and that's why they want to extradite you, because well, they want to stop the progress well, I, of your movement? And I'm mouthy, and most importantly, when the John Walters, the drug czar, came here in November 2002 to give everybody heck about our legal, liberalized marijuana attitudes and our safe injection sites for people who are addicted to, uh, you know, hard substances, well, he came here to try and ch convince us all to stop that. I heard about it, got a table of 10 activists and myself, and we heckled him the whole time. We called him a liar, an incarcerator, an asshole, a, a prison, and, you know, all sorts Who is this one more time? I'm John sorry. Walters. The current drug czar of the U.S. White okay. U.S. drug czar of the White House. Anyway, he was humiliated. It was all on television and everything, and he actually like turned red and apoplectic and. And he, three days later, a police investigation was opened in the city by, there were five tables of police officers at that thing to see John Walters, their hero. There were four, two tables of U.S. consulate, the mayor's officer, and then there was these ten activists who were totally tearing apart everything he said about marijuana, which was a lie. So, you know, ever since then, I've been investigated a lot. Right, so it's all, even Karen Candy, the, the head of the Drug Enforcement Administration, when I was arrested, and it's a famous thing. Four times she mentioned that my drug legalization uh, uh, bit time days were over, and that the drug legalization people got a lot less money now because we've taken them. I mean, it was dripping with contempt for all my political activity. It's not like drug use stopped in America a year and a half ago when I get arrested, did they? Did I hear yeah. that marijuana use has dropped, and people are not growing weed because I'm not selling seeds anymore? Anyway. See, that's what they say. I'm the biggest drug 
I'm the number one drug trafficking kingpin in all of Canada. They are saying I'm responsible for 1.1 million pounds of marijuana being produced, which would make me the largest marijuana which producer true. of all time in the criminal justice system. Yeah, by the way, 1.1 million pounds of marijuana is worth $3 billion. So let's say it is true, and I do not know if it's true. How would I know? But if it were true, I would be kind of proud of that because what man in his lifetime could bring $3 billion worth of wealth to the community he loves and cherishes? You're Johnny Potsy. It's like, yeah, it's like, so like, well, you can convict me, but I'm not going to be embarrassed or ashamed of that, right? That's my legacy, so I guess I get... And it's not like there's any victims here. Nobody's complaining. There's not a single complaint from, of, say, maybe a quarter million people I would have dealt with in 12 years. Not a single complaint from anybody. Everybody took the money I gave to them, $4 million I gave it. They took it. Nobody said, I'm not down with the seed money business, Mark. No, and politicians came to my home. They asked for my endorsement. They came to my conferences. They shook hands with me. There's photographs of me. And they all, everybody, nobody can have thought of me as a drug dealer. If they thought of me as a drug dealer, nobody would be let, they wouldn't let these politicians anywhere near me. Right? These people are all photographed with me all the time and stuff like that. You know, I say hi to them on the street and they stop and talk to me and what have you. So it's ridiculous. But the thing is, we have a cowardly federal government and they are the Canadian equivalent of the U.S. drug war. And so they're in cahoots with the Americans. So I'm being railroaded by both these governments out of pure ideology. I have not hurt anybody. There's no victim. Nobody's Why is there being more emphasis put on it now or recently than there was, say, in the early 2000s or in the late 90s or the mid 90s? It's just a new tactic. The government, Canada, signed these new MLATs, multiple legal assist, mutual legal assistance treaties with the United States. And the United States have conned a lot of English-speaking countries like Australia and Britain into signing these. And it basically makes U.S. law extends all around the world. So, for example, if I sold you a, a gram of marijuana and you're an American and you go back to the United States with it, we, I am now become a part of a conspiracy to export marijuana to the United States because you took it over and got caught and said my name or something like that. Right? right. And so, you know, if they want, they could extradite. Now, they wouldn't for a gram, but where is that threshold, right? I I didn't even send marijuana. The DEA tried to buy marijuana, and I got mad at them for bugging me because I said I don't sell marijuana. It's not my business. I had, and they tried to trap me, with, and they couldn't get me to say I said. And I even said, "Listen, you're being very stupid, even trying to buy marijuana. You will get caught. A person like you will get caught, and you will spend a long time in a U.S. jail for bringing ten pounds of weed over. So don't do it." Right. So they actually had to admit he refused to sell us marijuana and told us not to do it. Right. And but. So they got me for sending seeds over. Are you kidding me? Thomas Jefferson, the first, uh, the third president, and the first president were both big wow. cannabis fans and farmers and all that sort of stuff. So George Washington, the first president, actually has copious diary notes about all the different cannabis sativas and stuff he was growing there. So are you telling me that I'm sending seeds, like a, a, a shade of what the first president of the United States did in that regard, and like I'm going to spend like 300 years in jail? I love that too. They don't, 15 years is enough for me. I'll be 65 in 15 years, so that's like a death penalty. So instead they give you like 380 as if they own the next five reincarnations. And So if I come back as a frog, I have to be imprisoned in their system for another 80 years or something like that. Right? Like they're, they're so megalomaniac. Like they've got power over you for the next five eternities, right? And so I'm going to give you 380, right? Whereas, like, let's face it, 12, 15 years, and I'm facing a minimum of 50 to 60, and probably since I would be the all-time biggest drug trafficking kingpin of all time. Your drugs are. Yeah. In their eyes. Are, it's all that sort of stuff. And those guys are all like super maxes and stuff like that. Right. Uh, what what are your plans for, for prison if you do, I mean, you, well, you you are having to prep yourself. I've been arrested 22 times, and I've been jailed 17 times, and I've been jailed in 8 of 10 provinces for weed alone. And I've been raided six times, and they've taken a million bucks worth of my stuff at various times, sometimes without even charging me. Right. That is a common occurrence. The cops just jack in you for all your money and your weed, and then, you know, take off or whatever. But such is the battle, right? I mean, people say, well, when do you think pot will be legalized? I say, it doesn't matter when it's going to be legalized, because there'll always be people trying to make it criminal the next day anyway. So the battle is eternal. It's a struggle that never ends. It goes on forever. And you've got to figure that it goes on wherever you are, in jail, whatever. The struggle for freedom never changes, no matter where you are. You might get a little materially comfortable and forget that, but the reality is, even if pot were legal, we'd have to fight to keep it legal as much as we have to fight to make it legal now. Right. So we're never going to get some nirvana where everybody's totally down with our criticizing the authorities, questioning dogs. That's why they hate the marijuana people, because we cannot be herded into a conformist lifestyle. We don't buy into all their Christian bullshit, Islamic bullshit, religious, Judeo bullshit, the book of the law, the book of the Bible, all these one-book beliefs that are completely intolerant and cause all these wars. Pop people do not buy into them. Right. And so we are always going to be targeted and hunted down like dogs as long as we require people to have to conform to government. So 
the battle goes on forever. So I am not concerned. So why, of all the, uh, for, for the 6.5 billion people that are living on the planet with a, with a numerous, infinite amount of, um, uh, of interests and, and, and things to activities and, and policies to, to go for, why have you chosen marijuana as your... I get that. People say, why don't you hurt, save the whales or help starving people? I'm saying, well, you know what? People do starve and people have been working on that for hundreds of years. But what I know is that there hasn't really been a concerted effort to stop. Like in the last 50 years, 27 million people around the world have been arrested for pot. Now, 27 million people is about the population of Canada. So a whole country the size of Canada over 50 years has been jailed, prison, beaten, raped, and a variety of other things. And put in, I, mean, I, I spent three, I got a three-month sentence for one joint in Saskatoon only three years ago in the 21st century. That you serve? So this is barbarism. So when I see 27 million people in 50 years being arrested, when I see millions of those people have spent like decades in jail, like in the United States right now, the huge number of people, 60 percent of all people serving life sentences without parole are there for drugs. Come on, this is medieval punishments that we're in. And yet time keeps moving forward and some people even think pot's legal. Right. More people are in jail in Canada and America than ever before for pot. And the, uh, the, the superficial idols that we, we worship and idolize like Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston and Kate Hudson all smoke pot and advocate it. Do, yeah, the yeah. people that, that oh, many of them come here. Yeah. Many of them come lots of them come here. But and we don't photograph them for their own privacy and what have you. And that makes us a desirable destination for celebrities to come here is because they get a lot of privacy and Canadians don't go weird around famous people. They usually just freeze in silence, which is kinda nice, right? Definitely. So because um, then everything goes on as normal and everybody gets to be in on the on what's going on. I'm sorry I asked you this before the interview, but for the people that you know get to watch this throughout history, I have to ask you again, um, do you think think that it's necessary for us to respect the institutions that do not respect us? Well, we all have to swim in the same dirty water. So that means, really, that's why I wear a suit a lot of the times. So, you know, these things hurt your neck, it's hard to breathe, you know, and what have you, although women love it. But, uh, and, that's, and that maybe is why they, they hurt themselves to look good for us. I understand what they mean now. But, you know, I, I always wear suits to any kind of formal thing. I always try and be polite. I eschew bad language. You know what I learned? Old people will not listen to what you say if they think you're rude. And I learned that when I was 20, when I was a young person, and an old person told me that. I stopped listening to you when I thought you were rude, and I thought, wow. But it, and it's so easy to lose them just for that reason. It's so unnecessary. So I find that if you wear suits and appeal to what your grandma would think is respectable, you're going to win the largest group of people in the, out there. So I always pretend that my grandmother, who I never met, is out there, 90 years old, and what would she think? And if she thinks I would, she's got to think, would I leave my children with him for 24 hours? Could I trust a man like that? If someone can visualize themselves leaving their children with you for 24 hours, they will vote for you, they will believe you, and they will support you, even if they don't agree with your lifestyle. It's all a matter of trust and integrity. Do they believe you're a good person at, at heart, right? So I wear suits and I try and speak properly and I try and think of that 90-year-old grandmother who might be out there thinking that he seems like a nice young man, right? right. You know, that's also a vanity I like to think of myself as a young man and the only way I can do that is think of a 90-year-old grandmother since I'm nearly 50. But nonetheless, you know, I still have been doing this for so long that I still think people are out there saying he's going to get older one day and he'll change his mind. Right. Um... Oh, I had a question. I just lost it. You just um, oh, who would you like to play you? Who would you consider to play you in Prince of Pot, the mainstream movie? Well, fortunately, there is a movie coming out called Seeds of Sedition, the Prince of Pot story, and a really great guy plays me. Me. And uh, I'm the star of that one, and that's a documentary coming out on CBC. Uh, in fact, we get the beta copy of that movie this week, and it should be coming out sometime in April or May, just before the hearing. But if And Hollywood is doing preparatory work on a movie about me, but it'd be low budget. So the, the guy who plays me will definitely be an unknown. But I always thought Tobey Maguire could play the young Mark Emery. All right. Keanu Reeves could play the older Mark Emery. But, you know, and if I had $20 million, Whoa. Tom Hanks could play me. Yeah, I'll get Tom Hanks. Yeah, yeah. That so, uh, but we don't have twenty million dollars. So it's like one point two five million dollars is that budget. So it'll it'll probably be people we've never heard of before coming to a B movie near you. Oh, I don't know. As long as it's not some guy that was like. In, uh, well, I don't know, I've seen movies like Pothead, so you just want to get some guy who's got like a terrible reputation playing me, right? Right. So hopefully they'll get some unknown, you know, decent person who's a decent actor to play me. So where are we, and what what, what have you created here, and, and what what's... Well, this is the actual, the real people's headquarters. This is the BC Marijuana Party headquarters. It's called the Vapor Lounge. And uh, people come here and they use volcanoes, which are electric devices that create steam marijuana so that it's perfectly safe to take in with it. It's always perfectly safe to smoke marijuana, I believe, but if smoke, it's a wonderful experience to take THC through steam. 
And uh, the people coughing are bong hitting. They're not, they're not vaporizing, just to clarify that. And so we have vaporizers there at all the different tables. And we have this neat environment. And tonight is going to be our beta test for Hockey Night in Vansterdam. We're going to have a plasma screen right here. Oh, cool. We've got the high-definition box of digital TV. And we figured there's a 1,000 bars in the lower mainland of British Columbia, where we are in Vancouver, that have hockey games and alcohol. And I just read in the paper today the police go to at least 100 fights every weekend as a result of alcohol. And I've never had a single negative health anomaly or a fight fight of any kind in 10 years of hosting parties with marijuana. So I thought we should have Hockey Night in Vansterdam, which is the marijuana uh, nickname for Vancouver. And we should have that here so pot people can meet somewhere where there is an alcohol. We don't have to deal with the alcohol people. We can just all party together, watch the hockey. It's a hockey mad crazed town. Even the Vancouver Canucks have made a special uniform for me that's got my name on it with 420 as a special number. No one else has it. They've never made any other 420. We'll never make any other 420 jersey. Awesome. So, I mean, would they have made that for me if they thought of me as a drug they only made it for no. me like two, three years ago, right? And it was the, the head of the general manager of Orca Bay authorized it being made because they've never made a three numbered uniform and they had to get permission, right? <laughs> so, so this American thing, it's all just ideology. The Bush administration, Alberto Gonzalez just had a burr up his ass and John Walters and him got together and they decide this fucker is driving me crazy. Can we do something? Wasn't better? Vicente Fox an illegalized marijuana in Mexico? Yeah, and then he got his arm twisted. But that was a mixed bag too because they were going to allow, now only federales can house you for drugs in Mexico, whereas they were going to make it so that state, local, land federales. As long as you've got any kind of prohibition, you're going to be screwed. You've got to legalize all drugs, especially marijuana, because that's the drug, the illegal drug of almost 80% of the drugs in, in circulation. It's all about pot. Without marijuana being illegal, there would be no drug war. It wouldn't be big enough to be worthwhile. You'd have a few people on the margins. Did you know the prescription drug abuse now exceeds all illegal drug abuse and deaths? No. So yeah, oxycodone, all these things are giving people... It, it, they're, that, and they're becoming... That's the new people. you got all these old people who just got through their cancer treatment looking for like painkillers on the street now all over America. Now, I wanted to share a story with you, um, and I'm going to bring it back to you in one second. But I actually drove around Tommy Chong. For, for two hours in Los Angeles, which is horrible traffic, just to get across town. And I asked him, I said, Tommy, you've, been, you've smoked more weed than most humans on the planet. What kind of health, um, health uh, deterioration have you incurred? And he said, you know, when I was in prison, I got gout in my feet. And that was it. That was that, that had nothing to do with marijuana. Yeah. I was wondering if you... Too much pickled fish. Too much pickled fish. Well, what are they feeding him there? Uh, what, what, um, what's the worst... What's the worst that you've ever seen marijuana do harm to somebody? Well, okay, I, I, I've had about 12,000 joints and maybe about 25,000 bong hits in my career. So that's a lot of THC. They're going to smoke your cream. And I used to... Uh, that's, actually, that's touching if that could be done. Um, I like that. Note to stealth. Uh, Soil and green. <laughs> really green. Um, smoked instead of eaten. So... Oh, no, where were we on that? See, I got, oh, no, I no, I was asking you about, about the, uh, the t deterioration of... Uh... I've seen about... Thank you. I've seen about 18 people in 15 years have negative uh, reactions. And they almost always the same. They get very dizzy. They think they're going to die, actually. They say that. Oh, I'm dying. No, I said, no, you're not. And uh, they'll even get this total distortion. They're lying in the fetal position on the ground getting all weird. And they go, oh, I'm dying. How long have I been like this? Oh, eight minutes. And they go, no, I can't be eight minutes. It feels like be turning. And then eventually they're going to fall asleep in about 40 minutes after seeming hysterical. Or you can calm them and make them. And then the next one they feel great. So they had a bad psychological reaction. I've seen that 18 times. I even saw one guy once forgot he was here from Seattle. He was with his friends. And then all of a sudden he got very schizophrenic. He didn't recognize his friends. He ran outside. We had to chase him down for blocks because he didn't know the city at all, and we couldn't afford to lose him. So we got him back, and I brought him here. In three hours or four hours, he kept thinking we were all like the, holding him like the prisoner from that old TV show, right? We were all number seven, six, five, and he was number one. Whatever. But anyway, after about four hours, he snapped out of it, and he was normal again. So, of course, everybody learned, don't let him get near the weed ever again. And uh, so I've seen that once, and I've seen about 17, mostly young women, really, um, kind of have like these emotional things where they think they're losing control and they feel terrible and they might cry and stuff. Nothing bad happens. They, next day they're fine, but right. I don't know. Sometimes those people maybe need to have something in them jarred so that they are aware of something. Yeah, I, I, I used to have mushroom trips and people say, you ever had a bad mushroom trip? I had uncomfortable mushroom trips, like when my Zen masters would come out and talk to me for four hours. You'd understand if you had taken mushrooms. And, uh, and, and they, and they, 
pinprick all my pump pots and all the bad things that I said, and, and I maybe cry for four hours by staying all by making me reflect on all these things I had done. So here we are at 419, refle 419. reflecting on the time. And we have a whole bunch of people entering the vapor lounge. Yeah. So, so anybody uh, that wishes, yeah, come on, we want a 420. We're, we're gonna have a little celebration. Don't just splits, bongs, come on behind. Just it's circle here. around, Mark, come on, come and we're gonna here. get a shot. It's a live streaming show we're doing. The Tom Green show. Come on over here. Come on over here. <laughs> so we're on. Okay. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Back, back we, around. We, we want to create like a totally community solidarity. That's right. There you go. For so, the moment. Come on, snuggle in. Let's get close. Okay. The the bong here. We need a lighter. Anybody with? Okay, you're gonna do the bong hitter. So sneak up here. Get on that bong. All right. Okay. Okay. So yeah, sort of come right up there behind me. So they can get in the thing. Okay, good. Yeah. So yeah, there we go. Okay. More people get behind. Come on. Hold up. I need to get the angle right. It's the only thing. Come on, come on, come on. Where are you from? New West. New West. It's already too late. You know, we were and in th 30 seconds, 30 seconds, okay. 30 seconds we're all going to... So we're, but we're so live now, right? We're out, we are live right so now. So we're going to start bong hitting now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but exhale at 420. Okay. Right. Inhale. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy trails. Yeah. Go, go Canucks, go. Awesome, thank you guys. Stop it, Edmonton tonight. Stop them. <laughs> Excellent. I appreciate that very much. That was awesome. So I wanted to end. I didn't want to take up too much of your time. Thank you so much for meeting with me. Um, I did want to end by asking you. Um, when I walked in, you said that your attorney was saying that, that the outlook is not so good for you winning your case. Now, we never want, we never want to curse the situation, but you, you were saying that you were an advocate for people coming out of the woodwork to, to help, help assist you. P people come out and fight. You said you're interested in seeing how hard and how many hey, come out to fight. There's a price to pay for anything that's worthwhile. So all I know is if they put me in jail, there are hundreds of hemp stores out there that were inspired, inspired by my model. There are a number of magazines that imitate what we do. There is video broadcasting that's an imitation of pot TV. I've got flattering reflections of my work everywhere, from ballot initiatives to laws that were changed to the fact that cannabis and vi the fact that you can make this video in Canada is legal because of my contribution in 1995 in getting Judge J. Ellen McDonald in the Ontario Superior I Court totally to make print gracious. and video legal when it was illegal from 1987-1995 when it would not have been legal today if it were not overturned by our actions to do that. So, you know, my legacy lives on, so I am not frightened. And I'm 50 years old and I had great parents and a great life and women have always adored me and I've had a wonderful time smoking pot since I was 22 and doing my thing so if my fellow Canadians want to send me to some gulag to languish in some rotten place then so be it case or us or us. I'm not gonna worry about it I'm gonna keep busy no matter where I am so we'll just see I think Canadians will feel worse than I will I'm not gonna feel bad ah my my I am secure I was nice to everybody I ever met and did lots of great things nothing bad ever happened nobody's ever complained about my seed business that ever did any business with me so as far as I'm concerned it's just all ideology similar to if I were at the Inquisition in the 1700s and Pope Gregory swore an edict out against me it'd be the same thing fuck you Pope Gregory fuck you George Bush so um, there you go. now now what is pot TV what is cannabis culture I just want for people that don't know and that are not informed for ignorant people out there. What well, what what can people do to help educate themselves? Cannabis Culture is a wonderful magazine. They should look for it on their newsstands anywhere in North America. And if they don't see it, they should ask for it. Every every news dealer can get our magazine and have it distributed uh, it through their store, or you can get a subscription. Go to cannabisculture.com online. It's a great place to learn what's going on. And every all these things. Our magazine is cheap, five ninety nine. Our website is free. We are very much interested. What is pot? You'll TV? love our integrity and our ethics and the way we behave and what we do with our money. What is pot.tv? Pot.tv is a place where you can see over 3,000 videos all about cannabis that we started producing in the year 2000. And now we're all on YouTube, of course, and we are as well at Pot.tv. And YouTube's been great for everybody to cover the streaming fees and all that sort of thing for everybody's video. But before there was YouTube, there was Pot.tv for six and a half years. And so there's an additional, there's 3,000 shows just on Pot.tv and another 300 now we have on, on YouTube. 
produced at Pot TV. So we're a multimedia company now in that we stream through YouTube as well as our own server. And it is like, I'm not kidding, it's like about 1,400 hours all about cannabis. Man, it's amazing stuff. All right, well, I just wanted to take this opportunity while we still have full physical autonomy to uh, for me to thank you for, for coming hey, and sharing, sharing your vision with the world um, for, for many years. You've definitely been an inspiration to me and many others out there. And um, and it's been a pleasure to sit down and talk with you today. And I, I hope the best for you. And uh, and I am also willing to lend my support to anything that, to any any endeavors. Well, that you have. then certainly this broadcast will be great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, tune in tomorrow when I will be getting a tattoo across my chest that says honesty. <laughs> well, that was fun. Yeah. Now you'll get a plasma screen. <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, that was uh, Zach Wolk. He was uh, just transmitting live from Vancouver. Uh, apparently, it will look to be uh, some sort of s uh, smoking lounge or s uh, smoking bar in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, he was there with Mark Emery, a uh, large advocate of uh, legalization of marijuana. Uh, this uh, show will be available for download uh, almost immediately on the website. And uh, check back uh, tomorrow and every day this week at 4 p.m. Pacific time when Zach Wolk will be uh, broadcasting live from um, I really don't even know where. So uh, take care. Signing out. Hit that button. Pull this lever. <laughs>